Too many days in the darkness. Welcome to Prevention is Cure, brought to you by Precure.com, the podcast which brings you the latest in science and practice and challenging mainstream medicine and finding new and exciting ways of having a happier and healthy life. This series is looking specifically at mental health. We've become really concerned about the lack of translation of what science knows into what medicine does. In most societies, including the one I live in, one in five of us will have a serious mental health problem at some stage. The infrastructure, the practice, the gap between treatment and best practice is massive. This podcast series aims to do something about it. Prevention is cure. I'm your host, Professor Grant Schofield. In this podcast I interview Professor Katie Holton, who's a psychologist, a researcher in nutritional psychology from Washington, American University there. And I sat down and talked to her about her glutamate reducing diet. And myself, I've been really taken about this idea of glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter and the role it plays in the brain, the important but sometimes pathological role it can play. I hadn't really understood the exact role that diet could play in reducing glutamate because I didn't think glutamate crossed the blood brain barrier. But Katie explains how and when that can happen, and then talks about the results from her own careful clinical trials. She's quite the neuroscientist, so on occasion she dives pretty deep into advanced measurement techniques for trying to measure what's going on inside that skull of ours in that hundreds of billions of brain cells. So it's a really exciting and interesting area. It's rapidly expanding. I think my prediction is you're gonna see this type of way of eating the glutamate diet become very popular moving forward. Without further ado, here's Katie Holton. Too many days in the darkness Without a glimpse of the light Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight Professor Katie Holton, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, you are a nutrition researcher, but also you're particularly interested in this idea of glutamate uh, and the low glutamate diet. Why, why is glutamate even a, a neurotransmitter we should be particularly interested in? Well, it's funny. Glutamate is of interest in both fields of nutrition and neuroscience. Um, I'm a nutritional neuroscientist, so I study the effects of diet on the brain. And uh, glutamate is of interest from a neuroscience perspective because it's the most ubiquitous neurotransmitter in our body. Its job is excitatory to excite the next neuron in line. Uh, But from a food perspective, it's also of interest. Glutamate is a negatively charged amino acid in our diet. So it's a part of all of our proteins like meat that we may eat. But more importantly, it's also uh, used in its free form as a flavor enhancer in foods. So it is very commonly used as a food additive. And it can be found naturally occurring in its free form in some foods. And it's really, that is the area of my interest is understanding how that free glutamate in the diet can affect the brain. Right. And and so when you talk about additives, you're talking about things like uh, monosodium glutamate, MSG, and those sorts of things, or the other bits and pieces as well? Tons of other ones as well. Yeah, monosodium glutamate is the most well-known. Um, and that would be an example where glutamate's attached to one sodium molecule, monosodium glutamate. Um, but it can be used and actually added to foods under a, a whole host of names, especially here in the U.S. We have more food additives than other countries. Um, to give you an example, any hydrolyzed protein that's added to a food has free glutamate in it naturally. Um, because when you hydrolyze the protein, you're breaking it apart into its individual amino acids. Um, and so I think in your neck of the woods, you know, this would be your, um, your Marmite, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 
<laughs> would be an example of a product that contains free glutamate. Okay, well, you really got the the, the uh, local context down for us. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, and and the problem with glutamate, let's just think about it in the brain to start with in the, the dietary mechanism. So so one hypothesis is the idea that that glutamate gets quite high because of continued sympathetic expression or something like that, other reasons, and then that glutamate starts to spill out from the synaptic cleft, and then you've got a situation called glutamatic cytotoxicity. Why is that an issue? So excitotoxicity occurs when, like you said, when glutamate is in too high of an amount. Lots of things can cause that. So outside of um, an influence from something like diet, you could have, for example, if you have a stroke and you have that lack of oxygen to the brain, you are going to be in a state of excitotoxicity. And as you have cells die in the brain, you actually get more glutamate release and it spreads. And that's what causes the damage in a stroke. But that would all, that's an example where only what's happening in the brain is the cause. Um, but you also have people, I believe, who are being affected by glutamate in the diet. And those people um, tend to follow a pattern where they never had a problem with dietary glutamate until something like a trauma or an infection, or they had a massive stressful event in their life. And that it is after these types of occurrences that all of a sudden they become sensitive to dietary glutamate. And um, I believe that has to do with permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Okay, let's just explore, explore that one a little bit more in a moment. But is there also, if you're, because there's some potential other mechanisms that I was thinking you were going to say, but I, I'd be interested about that one as well. Um, first of all, that dietary glutamate in of itself could, could affect uh, something like the afferent vagus nerve and you could end up with more sympathetic expression in of itself that would cause more and directly cause more, more glutamate in the brain is that a plausible mechanism yeah well that's not yeah that's not far off you definitely can have an effect from stress in the yeah. sympathetic nervous system um, glutamate does play a role in our hpa axis which yeah. starts in our brain it's a signaling you know that occurs to release things like cortisol and epinephrine and that's our fight or flight response glutamate does play a role in that so anybody in a high stress situation could have more effects. Yeah. Um, you also can have a situation where someone has peripheral pain. Glutamate yeah. is a major player in pain neurotransmission. And so you can have a peripheral pain that actually ends up upregulating the system as well. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, we also need to be aware of other things like head trauma that predispose someone as well. So, so you could end up with, with a traumatic brain injury, a mild traumatic brain injury, you end up with some dead brain cells, they, they end up spilling more glutamate, you get a downward cycle. Uh, and then the problem then is that there's some, potentially some changes in the blood brain barrier that also now allow dietary glutamate to seep across into the brain more easily. Is that what you're hypothesizing? Yeah, so uh, we know that there's an interaction between inflammation, oxidative stress, and a glutamate excitotoxicity. And these three things basically have the ability to reinforce one another and to keep this cyclical action going. In the case of a head injury, what you would have is you'd have inflammation that's occurring from the injury. That inflammation can cause blood brain barrier permeability and also internally can affect glutamate release and the excitotoxicity and oxidative stress itself. So it actually can start the whole process from the head injury, but you're correct. If you get blood brain barrier permeability, then all of a sudden your diet matters even more because your diet could now be a source of glutamate. And, and it could be also a source of inflammation and oxidative stress as well, right? So you could, yes. you could end up with the, all three happening at once because of that and some other uh, external factors. Yeah, right. That's, it's, it's, and so how did you start to, Katie, how did you start to come into the idea of this hypothesis? Because actually it's not common. I'm, I'm a real fan of it, but frankly, in my neck of the woods, as you put it, I've had trouble finding anyone who's particularly interested. Oh, I don't know if it's a lack of interest, but it's a lack of uh, awareness, maybe. Um, you know, we don't have, uh, nutritional neuroscience is a very small field. 
there aren't very many of us um, around the world who do nutritional neuroscience work. Um, so I think that's part of the problem also. Um, I got interested in it actually right as I was starting graduate school. Um, I made some observations. I had a close friend who was having widespread chronic pain. Um, she was having massive fatigue, headaches. Um, she was having problems with balance. She had all of a sudden went from this really healthy individual who worked out a lot and, you know, what I would have thought ate really healthy. And she all of a sudden had her health deteriorate. And um, it was, it was fascinating as I started, I started looking into her symptoms and that range of symptoms because I was starting graduate school and I was interested and trying to figure out what could be wrong with her. And what was fascinating was I found these people online who were reporting their sensitivities to things like MSG and aspartame. Aspartame is a dipeptide of phenylalanine and aspartate. Aspartate can actually activate glutamate receptors, just like MSG or these other additives can. So um, when I started looking at this, these blogs and these people posting this, that they had the same spectrum of symptoms in a response to these food additives, I thought, well, this is really fascinating. Well, what do these food additives have in common? And then I, I realized it was glutamate and aspartate. And as I started digging into glutamate and aspartate and going down this road, I, I realized there was such great biological plausibility for how these food additives could actually affect neurotransmission in the body. So what I did was I started working on how to get rid of those in the diet, where they could be found because it was bigger than just MSG. So I basically started creating a diet, had my friend try the diet. And this is while I'm in graduate school, my friend had complete remission of all her symptoms, wow. complete remission. And I was blown away. I honestly didn't think it would help her to that extent. And I thought, oh my gosh, this has to be studied. No one's doing this. And this is fascinating that you can have food additives affecting someone's health to this really great extent for this young person who was so healthy. So um, that's basically how I got, I went down this road. I said, I have to do this for my research and I've been doing it ever since. Right. So that's a really great way to do research, isn't it? To, to, to do those sort of N equals one type things, notice some astonishing results and then start to take it even further. Uh, and, I, and I noticed in one of the, there's, there's two ways I discovered you, once through my our mutual colleague, Professor Julia Rucklidge, who's here in New Zealand, who's really a, a star in uh, your field. Uh, and then also there's a couple of published studies, and I guess we'll talk about the, the Gulf War illness mm -hmm. study now, if that's okay. Um, so you, you, you've done a trial with the low glutamate diet. So I've got, I've got a couple of stage questions here. The first of all, what is the low glutamate diet? What does it specifically look like when you're giving that prescription? And then we'll get into Gulf, Gulf War illness and that sort of thing, because I don't think people outside of the US would initially have heard of that, but it seems to be a combination of some other things. So the, yeah. so the low glutamate diet, you're prescribing this. What, is it, what does it actually mean? What's in it? What does it look like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Yeah. So it is a, a really healthy whole food diet. Um, it removes all sources of free glutamate and free aspartate from the diet. Um, so it's restricting specific food additives that contain those free amino acids. It also restricts foods that naturally contain free glutamate or free aspartate. So examples of that would be soy sauce, fish sauces, um, the Marmite I mentioned, you know, a second ago, um, Things even like tomatoes, for example, contain some free glutamate. We don't restrict some fresh tomato, but we do restrict tomato sauces. We don't have people consume lots of that. Um, so uh, bone broth is very popular right now. A lot of people thinking that they should be eating lots of bone broth. But if I was to make my own bone broth at home, that process releases free glutamate. So part of it is teaching them how that's formed and things like that not to do. Um, and then, and then somebody, because you're getting the proteins and the collagens and the, those things and you're, and you're breaking them down so much. Correct. You, when you yeah. break them apart, you're freeing up the glutamate and the aspartate. Yeah. Yeah. So for a person who's not sensitive to glutamate, that's fine. But for a person who's sensitive, it can actually really cause them to feel horrible. So, um, and then the other aspect to the diet is we teach them what to eat. So we really focus a lot on where all of the micronutrients are found in the diet. 
So we give them a list of foods highest in each micronutrient. We also teach them about antioxidants and their role against oxidative stress. And we say, teach them where those antioxidants are found. So then we really help them remove those food additives and then build this healthy diet. This is important because there are many uh, micronutrients that are actually protective against excitotoxicity. And then at the same time, we can actually affect neuroinflammation and oxidative stress at the same time, which is the goal. That's my next step in my research is I'm going to be actually testing the effect on not only excitotoxicity, but also oxidative stress. And yeah, yeah, great. And, and so what is a, a couple of good low glutamate diet breakfast and maybe some lunches and some dinners? Can you give us some examples of the sort of thing? Yeah, you're so you for for breakfast, you could do something like uh, Greek yogurt and you could add fresh berries and you could sprinkle on some muesli on top. That would be an example. Or you could do something where you're making eggs, like, um, you know, where you're sauteing some vegetables and you're adding eggs and making a scramble with a side of fruit. Yeah, you're talking my sort of language now. And, and, and some lunches? Some lunches. So um, one thing that people can't do a lot of is they can't do lunch meats, which are very popular here in the U.S. So we really try to get people to start making dinners that they have leftovers with and they bring their dinners for lunches. Um, you could also do things like salad. Uh, you know, you have leftover chicken that you have chopped up and you make a nice green salad with a homemade balsamic vinaigrette for example, yep. and we provide them with recipes to help them with making things like salad dressing at home and how to marinate meat safely and do that at home, that sort of thing. So when you talk about lunch meats, you're really sort of talking about these fairly highly processed types of yep. um, uh, ham and turkey and, and yes. reconstituted things. Yeah, I, th I don't think it's just the US that are popular. I think they're popular uh, pretty much everywhere, but... Uh, yeah. yeah sure. Well, especially here, we, we see a lot of people, they have trouble with lunch because they're so used to eating sandwiches for lunch. Mm. Yeah. So it's kind of helping them rethink their lunches. Um, and But once people start making really healthy dinners and they have leftovers, we found that's the easiest thing for people to do is just to have that for their lunch because it takes less thought process too. Yeah. And a lot of people are really successful when they do that. And obviously all your things like your sodas and your sugars and those sorts of things that in of themselves are inflammatory, even though they might not be causing extra glutamate. Yeah. So you're avoiding those, obviously. The diet yeah. sodas, is that the aspartame part of that? Is that that's obviously way out? Yeah. Yeah. So all artificial sweeteners are excluded. Yeah. So there's no diet soda, no regular soda. Yeah. Um, we actually don't even recommend people have juice. Um, yeah. We recommend that people really focus on drinking water and that they're getting their fruit from, as whole fruit as part yeah. of their diet that comes with fiber. Okay, well, that's sounding like a pretty good, uh, uh, good healthy diet. And I get, guess the things I was picking up there that would be different over and above what I would normally recommend is that you're specifically singling out things like the soy sauce and those uh, tomato sauce type products uh, you when you talked about meat and the marination and the and the preparations, you feel there's a the, the different preparations would affect the amount of glutamate. Yeah. So, for example, if you were to take some meat and marinate it, and you marinate it overnight, part of that marination process can break down the protein structure and free up glutamate. Yeah. So we don't recommend prolonged marination of meat. Um, we recommend shorter cooking time, not this long cooking process. Like some people do this slow cooked meat that's yeah. cooked for hours. We don't recommend that. We also don't recommend marination for more than a few hours. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. There's a, I don't know if it's popular in the U S but it's popular here simply because we have a lot of them, but the idea of uh, kiwi fruits, I guess you could call them kiwis, um, that they're quite popular tenderizers for meat and they, they hydrolyze some of the protein. So I guess that would play a part in, in, in that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I guess it would probably depend how long you're doing it for. Yeah, okay. Right on. Okay, so, so let's go on to the, the Gulf War illness because it, it, it's not something I've heard of, but so far as I can tell, this is a sort of combination of uh, PTSD, chronic pain, and, and I guess chronic fatigue. Is that an accurate description of what these people are coming say... back with? Yeah, I, um, if you're familiar with fibromyalgia, it's very similar to fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. 
where you have this spectrum of illness, they have chronic pain, they have fatigue, they have cognitive dysfunction, they have mood dysregulation, problem sleeping, um, they'll have many times have gastrointestinal issues. Um, so you have a, this host of problems. Um, on average, you'll see a person have 21 symptoms, for example. Wow. So yeah, it, it has very high symptom burden. The reason it got named Gulf War illness is because we saw this spectrum of symptoms in people who were coming back from serving in the Gulf War conflict 1990 to 1991. And um, I don't know if New Zealand had troops there, but I know Australia did. And so it could be that you guys have people, um, at least in Australia, that are suffering from the same spectrum of symptoms. Yeah, I think so usually maybe- usually here we just try to send guys or, or people who are going to be at the back building bridges or something, not, not having to be at the front, it's sort of our approach to helping out. So okay. <laughs> maybe they well, don't get so exposed they- to so much. Oh, yeah. And so these individuals were exposed to a bunch of neurotoxins um, in this short conflict. And they were unique for that reason, because their neurotoxin exposure was so high. And so many of these neurotoxins actually affect what we call acetylcholine, if you're familiar with it. Acetylcholine, they, they affect an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And so we knew that there was excitation occurring from acetylcholine. But what actually happens with this acetylcholine poisoning is that downstream, it causes the release of glutamate. Mm -hmm. And so the neurotoxic damage is actually being mediated by glutamate in this case. And so because this spectrum of symptom is is similar to what I've studied in the past, and I've had success with treating with the low glutamate diet, I was really interested in looking at these Gulf War veterans to see could we see a similar benefit in this population? And because I knew that those those exposures were leading to downstream release of glutamate, there was biological plausibility for how, you know, glutamate could really matter in this illness. And and then there's this sort of vicious cycle as well. As soon as that glutamate starts to rise and become toxic, then then you're getting more uh, atrophy and death of other uh, neuronal cells. And and so the process is, is... hasn't stopped so they continue to get get problems rather than recover yeah their their health burden is quite great um yeah. so they they really are a population that is suffering greatly um, and, and it's, it's more men than women well in the conflict we only had seven percent of the troops that were deployed were women okay. and so there's a smaller proportion that were women just because they were a smaller proportion deployed yeah um and and, and the trial you you, you saw some pretty outstanding results, really, some big effect sizes. Yes. Yeah, so we saw just quite dramatic results. And what, one of the things that was so dramatic was that we saw improvement across the board in all of these different symptom domains, which, you know, makes this group really unique because they suffer in all these different areas. So just to give you an example, we saw their total symptom burden drop. And so I, I mentioned on average, they had about 21 symptoms at baseline. Um, after a month on the diet, we had about nine of those symptoms go away on average. Oh, that quickly. That's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. We, we lowered that overall symptom burden. And then in each area, we saw significant improvement. So for example, we saw significant improvement in pain, significant improvement in fatigue. We saw significant improvements in cognitive function. Um, and we even saw significant improvements in depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So it was quite powerful how it really seemed to affect everything. And so we're working right now. I just submitted a grant actually to um, do the next steps in this, to do this in a larger trial, and to really look at this neurotoxic triad of neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and excitotoxicity to see if we're actually affecting all three of these things. Um, Because that may be one of the keys to where diet is a little more powerful than any medication out there because medications really can affect oxidative stress and that inf- inflammation piece always at the same time with excitotoxicity. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, you know, often I wonder with the medications when you're interfering with one specific part of neuronal homeostasis that there's often effects that you didn't expect or want, whereas when we're doing this more holistically, I guess if that's what you use, or at least as a whole organism, then we we see things 
homeostatically fall into place more yeah. easily. Yeah. I really like the way you're talking about that neuroinflammation, uh, oxidative stress, and, and glutamate. Often in diabetes, I'm talking about that triad of inflammation, glycation, and mm-hmm. oxidative stress, and, and one affecting the other every, every which way. So I guess it's the same thing. So I, I don't know if it's the same for you guys there, but one thing that f- frustrates us is that when we f- get good trial results, then one thing as a scientist and a practitioner is to think, oh, this is going to be great. People are going to read about this and, and it might become a more mainstream treatment. Is, uh, you got any frustrations there? You know, I have to say one wonderful thing about working in Gulf War illness is that um, this research is funded through the Department of Defense here in the United States. And they really care about it getting to the veterans as a treatment. Yeah, right. So they're not they're not only supporting the research, but they're really they ask for me and my next steps to say, how is this going to be taken to the veterans? If you can prove and confirm that this is going to work in a larger group of individuals, how can you then get it to the veterans? And I I have to say I really appreciate that as a researcher. So we have a what we call the VA system, Veterans Administration yeah, here. Yeah. And um, so our veterans have uh, medical care through this VA system, and they have access to dietitians inside the system. So my thought is that if I confirm my findings in this larger clinical trial, my plan is to actually do trainings with these dietitians at these VAs across the country to actually allow us to implement and train them on how to um, administer the diet to veterans across the country. So it really allows us to have kind of a a broader effect in a faster period of time than we would if it wasn't a veteran population. Yeah, that's really, that's actually really interesting and good to hear. And I can see how that works. I mean, that is just a continuing frustration of mine of translating research results into any form of practice anytime soon in a mainstream medical system. I guess the other thing you've got going for you is the rapidity of the of the outcomes, and these are debilitating outcomes for for people who would, uh, I assume, sooner not have these symptoms. So uh, exactly. once that word it's gets very, out there. Yeah, it's very motivating. If you're working with people with diabetes, for example, you know, you I'm sure you've noticed that not everyone is excited about changing their diet to no. treat the diabetes, right? Um, and even though I could take a person and say, I, could, I can stop, I can reverse your type 2 diabetes, I could do that, but the person would have to be interested in doing what I'm telling them to do. And that's not always the case. Not everyone is motivated to do that. In the case of these veterans with Gulf War illness, they're very motivated. Uh, They're suffering so greatly. So not only are they motivated initially because of their symptoms, but when I can show them that they feel better in a month, they're very motivated to keep going. And to stay on the diet because, you know, you're staying on the diet, you feel good. And you come off the diet, you feel bad again. Yeah, and right. so it's reinforcing yeah. that way. Yeah. So uh, we talked about micronutrients of different sorts. Can we just explore some of those specific things and for other reasons? So there's one of the theories, and I think it's been, there's a couple of trials in, in multi moderate depression is that, uh, magnesium making it into the synaptic cleft could act as a as an NDMA receptor antagonist. In other words, that helps with uh, dispersion of glutamate ecto- toxicity. Is is, is yeah, dietary magnesium? Is, yeah, magne- is that a thing? Yes, absolutely. Magnesium is extremely important. Yeah. Magnesium actually causes a soft blockade of the NMDA receptor. It yeah. sits inside of the NMDA. Re- an MDA receptor. And so it makes it less reactive, if you will. And so when we have a person in a state of excitotoxicity, that magnesium block will be removed. But if the magnesium block is not even there to begin with, it's one less step that has to occur. So we definitely see that magnesium makes a huge difference. Um, And it is something that in the United States, we have about half the population is thought to be deficient in magnesium. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing, isn't it? And so are there any specific foods or are you supplementing with extra magnesium of, of, of some sort? Or is that, where does that come in? Yeah. So for my research, I don't supplement. Um, and so they get it from food sources. Um, the number one best source of magnesium in the diet is pumpkin seeds. And so um, we have foods like pumpkin seeds where we're actually asking people to incorporate them into their diet more frequently. 
Um, and so that's part of that list of foods highest in each micronutrient that we give people. We put a lot of emphasis on these micronutrients that actually protect against excitotoxicity and magnesium is one of them. Right. And there's, there's other plausible micronutrients, I guess, that uh, uh, directly or indirectly involved probably because they're uh, antioxidants or anti-inflammatory. So we're thinking about various types of, of omega-3 fish oils, vitamin D, yeah. B-complex. Omega yeah, omega-3s yeah, so yeah. Omega and vitamin D um, are very, very important. Um, omega-3s definitely have an anti-inflammatory effect, yeah. and they also are thought to have a, an effect against excitotoxicity. Vitamin D, again, very, very important, actually has effects on neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and, um, and excitotoxicity. The oxidative stress one is a little indirect. It plays a role in gene transcription. And so it plays a role in these antioxidant enzyme systems being produced in the body. So to cover those, you really have to have fish intake. Yeah. Um, if you're going to get enough omega-3s and vitamin D, um, barring good sun exposure for the vitamin D. Um, so we, we actually recommend cod liver oil um, and fish consumption so that people are covered in that regard. But there are other ones, vitamin C and vitamin E are both yep. very interesting. They also can affect all three aspects of the neurotoxic triad. Um, so they both are quite powerful. Another one would be riboflavin. Um, again, riboflavin can affect all three aspects. Uh, so it's very, very much of interest. And then um, vitamin B6 is also of interest. This is because vitamin B6 is a cofactor for the conversion of glutamate to GABA. Yeah. Now, GABA is your major inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so if you have a vitamin B6 deficiency, you're going to have too much glutamate and not enough GABA, and you're going to have that excitation occurring. So really making sure that people have optimal vitamin B6 is important for that, as well as the production of all of your other neurotransmitters, including things like serotonin that affect mood. Um, are totally dependent on vitamin B6. Right. And I guess that's a good point that you're just making there is that we've got this uh, in normal neuronal homeostasis, we've got glutamine and GABA uh, and glutamine in the middle as well around the, 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 the conversion of one to the other to the other and, and under normal conditions that, that would just be balancing out quite nicely. Is that That's what you're... Yeah, in our nervous system, we don't want too much of either one. So yeah. too much glutamate, we have that overexcitation, but too much GABA is not good either. Too much GABA actually causes too much inhibition. And this would be the, an example would be a person getting drunk. You're having GABA agonism occur with the alcohol and that's taking the person the other direction. Um, and that's lowering inhibition in the nervous system. So we want balance you know, between these two neurotransmitters. And uh, 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 is there a way of thinking about how GABA dialed up feels? You have a, a, a couple of beers or wines and you're feeling quite uh, chilled. You, you'll go to sleep quite easily because that's part of that, that get to sleep cycle, but then uh, glutamate never returns in its normal quantities, which you might need in REM sleep. Uh, yeah. And that's, to me, that's actually a, a, an untalked about pathway around the sort of destructive effects of alcohol. Yeah, a lot of people mistakenly believe you know alcohol helps them at the moment because it appears to be helping you. But really in our nervous system, our body says, no, 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 we have too much GABA. So yeah. what does it do? It upregulates glutamate production in the mm. brain. And so then when that GABA effect wears off because the alcohol is coming out of your system, you have excess glutamate. We'll have people who are sensitive to glutamate commonly talk about the fact that if they drink a glass of alcohol, you know, and then they go to bed, that they will wake up in the middle of the night, unable to sleep and anxious. Mm. They wake up this feeling of anxiety. It's mm. very, very common in people who are sensitive to glutamate. And it's really that because of that effect. Yeah. We, and we've, I don't know if this is, you probably noticed this in the U S as well with these COVID type lockdowns that our alcohol consumption went up, but sleep quality went down, anxiety was up anyway. So probably none of those were helping the other. Yes. Hey, so. Okay, we've, we've been talking in that sort of uh, chronic fatigue, golf war, illness type space, but what I'm also surprised about, if you look across the other um, neurological issues, so if it's neurodepressive, neuropsychiatric, um, we talked a little bit about neurotrauma, uh, neurodegenerative, then 
then you could suppose almost the exact same mechanisms of glutamatic cytotoxicity for, for one reason or, or another, and therefore potentially the role that a low glutamate diet could play in those in those spaces. What do you, what do you make of all that? And you're excited about that? Or, and who's going to do all this work? Yeah, I know. It's more work than I'll probably be able to do in my lifetime. Um, but yes, we like I mentioned, we're already seeing effects in Gulf War illness. We've seen these great psychiatric effects. Uh, we have a paper under review right now that research will be published hopefully soon. So um, we're really excited about these effects on the from a psychiatric front as well. That is not surprising because we know that glutamate is in high amounts and things like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Uh, so it's not super surprising. There are other psychiatric conditions where you have kind of the opposite effect. Schizophrenia would be the best example of this. Um, for example, like with the positive effects of schizophrenia that are really your psychotic symptoms, those can be induced if you block the NMDA receptor for glutamate. Right. And so, and that means that it's a low glutamate phenomenon when a person's in a state of psychosis. Um, so what we, we do know there's some ex, excitotoxicity occurring in other brain regions uh, with schizophrenia, but really where the psychosis is stemming from is actually would be a low glutamate uh, mm -hmm. problem. And so it really begs the question, it would be really interesting to see if we could modulate glutamate and have effects on those symptoms. But that one's a little more complicated. Other than that, the depression, anxiety, and PTSD, most definitely. I think there's some exciting stuff coming out. And, and neurodegenerative or neurotraumatic as well. I guess we've talked about some of those, but you're getting brain cell death for any reason, then presumably that's an issue. Yeah, so um, I have not been able to do any testing in neurodegenerative conditions. Um, or neurotraumatic conditions. Neurotraumatic, definitely, I think it could play a role because we know that trauma can induce blood-brain barrier permeability. We know that those people are very likely to have a problem with dietary glutamate. So I, I think that would be kind of low-hanging fruit to do some testing in that area. The neurodegenerative conditions are all going to be their own you know, process uh, yeah. to study. Yeah. Um, I think multiple sclerosis would be a really interesting one mm -hmm. where you definitely see a lot of effects from the inflammation, oxidative stress and excitotoxicity. Um, and I would, my, my guess would be that could be potentially more mod modulating from diet than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Yeah. It's, it's interesting with that, uh, EMS that you talked about, there's a, uh, a U.S. doctor called Dr. Terry Walls who had. MS is she's still, I think, called the Walls Protocol. But when she describes her Walls Protocol diet, she doesn't specifically talk about glutamate in any way at all. Um, but it's pretty much exactly what you were saying, right? Uh, and, and she's enjoyed quite a bit of success with that. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And one thing that's interesting here in, in our hospitals, and I, I think it's probably the same in the US, is that I came across this idea that if you end up with a ischemia in the brain, maybe from a, a, a heart attack or a, for neonatal hypoxia, then one thing they do here is they induce hypothermia and they in, infuse you with intravenous magnesium. Uh, and, and when you ask the ICU doctors about this, they don't talk about glutamate at all. They just go, oh, yeah, it sort of helps them relax and sort of gets the inflammation down and just stops things. But when you actually start to look at, especially the animal models around this, the mechanism of, of reduced hypothermia and, and intravenous magnesium, then then it's really around glutamate excitotoxicity. What do you make of that? Um, you know, I haven't I haven't followed that research in detail, but I, I think it's a super exciting area. Um, and I could definitely see that it could have effects on glutamate. Yeah. Uh, even the magnesium alone would have effects on glutamate. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's fascinating research. Yeah. And actually, I'm just back this morning from one thing I've been just trying out of myself and my family. It's winter here. And if you get into cold water, um, mm -hmm. this idea of cold water immersion and, and mood, um, especially for mild to moderate anxiety, is an interesting idea. Um, and, and perhaps part of that might be um, its reduction in uh, glutamate and inflammation in these. Yeah, that should things. be studied. Yeah, yeah, well, we've got a master student onto that at the moment, actually, which is an interesting um, idea. And then presumably the idea of exercise, these other sort of levers in, in mental health and well-being could have 
you know, pr- similar or peripheral pathways of um, exercise, uh, uh, breathing well, Definitely, techniques. When, when it comes to glutamate, one thing I should probably mention is really weight training and the importance of weight training. Mm-hmm. Because what happens when you weight train is you, when you have muscle building occur, your body's going to use glutamate to build that muscle. Mm -hmm. And so you actually can lower your peripheral glutamate levels somewhat by weight training. So if a person actually is in a state of muscle building, so that's one where, you know, it makes a difference from a diabetes perspective because you're making that muscle become more efficient at using glucose for fuel, which is excellent for diabetes, but it also works really well from a glutamate perspective. What do you reckon about the focus in in neurodepressive disorders on serotonin, which is really a, a monetary neurotransmitter and, and 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 really at at the exclusion of everything else there do you think that's going to fade into the background as a, as a less effective model no i don't I, i'm serotonin does have its effects on, on mood um and serotonin also has effects on glutamate um which is why i think you've seen this treatment with serotonin it's not just about serotonin there's also some great work and I, something I'm really interested in on the neuroinflammation front is really the effects of inflammation on the conversion of tryptophan to serotonin. What we know is that it can push that pathway toward what we call the kynurenine pathway. Not only does that make less serotonin be produced, but it also makes something called quinolinic acid be produced. And quinolinic acid can activate glutamate receptors and yeah. act as an excitotoxin. And so um, it's a, yet another way you have- Yeah, it's a completely different pathway, pathway, right? Yeah, it's, yeah it yeah. just pushes okay. it to a different pathway. So then you, what you have in that situation, right, is you have excitotoxicity occurring that can be affecting the depression, but you also have less production of serotonin happening. Yeah. And so- And they just got not, a lower mood, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. I think that there's just a dual effect happening and I think that you're right. I think so much attention was paid to serotonin that you have to see less about glutamate. One of the issues and the reason I think that that's the case is because serotonin, we can modulate with drugs very easily, but when it comes to glutamate, you don't want to stop glutamate. So if I block the glutamate receptor with ketamine, I can cause psychosis. So I don't want to do that. I want glutamate to be there and to function normally. I just don't want there to be too much of it. And and to date, we don't have a good drug for that. We have some drugs that like memantine that's used for Alzheimer's um, that can do that somewhat um, safely, but you're going to have side effects when you modulate glutamate because glutamate is so important and so ubiquitous in the brain. So I think that that's another reason that the focus on serotonin is easier. It's yeah, right. Safer, and, 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 and there's a few a few issues you raise there that, that glutamate's ubiquitous and therefore part of the problem in, in science here is measurement thereof in the brain. That, that That's an issue, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And then secondly, you mentioned ketamine, which is a pretty big sledgehammer to wield. But nonetheless, actually, um, at least in this country, it's been used reasonably successfully with with intractable chronic pain uh sort of and depression yeah yeah and major depressive disorders but but yeah you're right i mean you're not you're you're interfering pretty (laughs) yes yes you're chucking a lot at it right yeah Uh, and we also have people who are abusing ketamine so there's street use of ketamine um in the u.s they call it special k Um, It's a very addictive drug. It's a hallucinogen because when you block glutamate, you go toward that psychosis end and you can hallucinate. Um, And so people use it as a street drug as well. So I think there's some issues with ketamine, you know, even though it's showing without a doubt that glutamate is playing a huge role in things like chronic pain and depression because it can modulate those so well. Um, But I don't think it's the answer. To yeah, and, and actually, just to get into a field that I'm completely out of my depth with, and I'm, I'm not sure about you, Katie, but there seems to be an increasing amount of research and discussion, especially on the sort of biohacking community in the US around around psychedelics and their effect in the brain. And one of those uh, effects might be around glutamate. Uh, oh, absolutely, yes. Receptor uh, antagonism, and so 
that's an interesting area. Do you know anything about that? Have you got any comments on that? Um, I, you know, I'm not following the research on it. Um, I know that there are some p- individuals who are um, pushing for it, you know, that people have, you know, um, been reporting effects from it. And I think there's probably a role for it, uh, for that interoception that they're looking for, you know, but um, I think it needs a lot more research before we're going to be at a state like that. Yeah, and, and, and I guess there's there's other things going on there as well, uh, and, and you want some pretty close supervision if you're actually engaging in that. Plus, it's actually illegal, I think, in most virtually every country in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to help you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So so where where do you see this field going in the next five ten years? Where where are we going to be with nutritional neuroscience, especially around glutamate? What what would you imagine that to to unfold? Like. Well, I, I'm seeing a, just a huge increase in attention. So I can say that I have students approaching me all the time who are looking to get degrees in nutritional neuroscience, which is a really good sign. There's interest in the, in the field. Um, I think it will take some universities really backing nutritional neuroscience as a program that they want to create mm-hmm. and where we can really get these students with great training. Um, but I think that the, the research is really taking off. And I think a lot of people are paying attention to glutamate in uh, many different neurological areas. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of great research coming out. We have some excellent researchers who are doing great animal models looking at uh, the function of glutamate. And that's been done for years. We actually have a great body of knowledge on mm. glutamate yeah, that's a good um, point. because of the just great, great research that's been done for so many decades. So it's, that's really there. It's just now taking it to this next step where people are, you know, open to thinking about it outside of the pharmacological side and really talking about modulating it in these healthier ways, in my opinion. Yeah, that's going to be a a great space to watch. I guess the other thing which is encouraging is that when we think about neurological treatments a lot of the time we're quite concerned about negative side effects whether it be antidepressants or uh, antipsychotics or anticonvulsants uh, or or pain management and really it's hard to imagine what those risks would be from a low glutamate diet yeah we see no side effects so and we see you know (laughs) The, not only are we not seeing negative side effects, but we see some other positive benefits like blood pressure being reduced, mm. even though we weren't aiming to reduce blood pressure or people losing weight who weren't trying to lose weight at all. They weren't restricting their food take and intake at all. Um, so we've had some reports of people who said that their cravings for junk food completely went away. Um, and so I have a student in my lab who's going to be following up on that work actually to really kind of zoom in on this idea of cravings, because again, if we want people to eat well, not craving the junk food is, is half the battle. Well, there's another little quick little rabbit hole, if you don't mind, there's this, um, idea that of the interaction between dopamine and, and the glutamate pathways and, and, once you start to delve into that literature and you start to see there's more discussion, more and more discussion now around, around dopamine being monetary, but in fact, uh, the excitatory effect of glutamate being an important factor mm-hmm. in that. Is that, am I describing that in any way correctly or can you, can you expand on that? Yeah. So neurotransmitters can interact with each other both, both ways. So there are a direct effects of dopamine on glutamate and the glutamate also affects dopamine release. And so if you're talking about kind of a, uh, a positive effect that we have from eating food, that's, that's, you know, evolutionarily, we want to have a positive association with eating, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't eat and then we would die. Yeah. So we want that to some extent. But what's happened is we have some highly processed food that is giving us too much of a pleasurable effect, if you will right? And so too much dopamine release from a food. And so that is driving behavior. And that's, that's driving behavior. It doesn't matter if you're talking about just straight sugar, or artificial sweeteners, which are hundreds of times sweeter than sugar, um, to these effects from glutamate. And it's fascinating, we'll see things where people will come into the study, and they'll say, I feel addicted to diet soda, 
Like they, they feel like they are incapable of stopping their consumption of diet soda, which it's very, it's fascinating to hear people say that about food, um, a food item that they can't, they physically feel addicted to it to the point that they, they question being able to be in the study because they don't think they can stop. So I, yeah, I definitely think there's a connection there that will be interesting to study in the future. Yeah, it's interesting. I had a student who was studying food addictions and she sort of felt she'd come, there's quite a strong uh, network of people around the world who describe themselves as food addicts or form of food addicts. Um, and they're quite down the, the sort of alcoholism model of abstinence. Uh, but then you see a whole bunch of people eating you know, similar foods who still have some issues but can stop it and then just use it in moderation. And there's other people who seem to have no issues. And um, perhaps it's it's plausible that there's some differences in uh, glutamate uh, sensitivity and those sorts of things in those different groups of people. Yeah. Or maybe it's just an amount of glutamate being produced based mm. on what foods they're consuming or the yeah. quantity of food they're consuming. Yeah. I'm super excited about this uh, stuff. I'm sort of hoping to steer some of our research and my students into the same direction. I'm, I guess I'm also interested in this whole, I guess I'll describe the other letters, which is cold, uh, breathing, uh, exercise as well as just diet. I'm, I'm also pretty interested in um, lower carbohydrate diets. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, you look at the presence of ketones in the brain, and I wonder what that's got to do with it, if anything. But uh, that's another plausible thing, right? Well, I look forward to seeing more of your research too. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's just, um, yeah, just keep learning on this stuff. And it's, I'm so excited about it. So. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks okay. for chatting. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Prevention is Cure, brought to you by Precure.com, with me, Professor Grant Schofield. At Precure, we're developing a way to help medicine help change the world. We're filling that gap. We're helping train health coaches and mental health coaches. We're bringing short but effective behavior change programs over 29 days to you to help you learn for yourself and help others as well be healthier. We're trying to create a community of like-minded people, people like you who want to use the latest science and practice to change lives for the better. Join us at precure.com. Get involved in our communities. We'd love to have you along for the ride. Precure.com. Too many days in the darkness Without a glimpse of the light Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight